Has anybody here ever programmed Visual Basic? Okay. Uh, do you remember what the array in You know how arrays in Visual Basic start at one? And how that's wrong? <laughs> Start at O, start at O, real arrays are indexed at zero. VB's wrong, and they've been all along. Math never bothered me anyway. <laughs> we'll let a few more people uh, wander in. So this is Jump into Jupyter Notebooks. Um, one of the nice things about uh, Jupyter Notebooks is that they are very easily shared on GitHub. And in fact, uh, you can follow along and look at the, uh, I'm presenting using Jupyter Notebooks rather than with slides. And if you want to go to co colab.research.google.com, I will show you how to get this presentation right now on your machine. All you need is a working web browser and a connection to the internet. This is a song I used to do when I was a developer evangelist at Microsoft. Oompa loompa doopity doo. I would wait for service pack two. If you don't, your screen might turn blue. Oompa loompa. Service pack two. <laughs> And I'll do a little more throughout the afternoon. But why don't we get started with jumping into Jupyter Notebooks. So if you want to follow along, there's a really easy way to do it. I'm just going to open a new browser window and explain to you, uh, make it really easy. There is a URL you can go to, Colab. Um, I can't zoom in on the uh, address bar, but it's Colab, C-O-L-A-B, dot research dot Google dot com. If you go to it uh, and you're already hooked up to a Google service like Gmail, you can uh, actually just dive right in. If not, what you can do is you'll be taken to a web page with uh, a menu on top that says File, Pick File, Pick Open, Pick Open Project, and you'll be taken to a dialog box like this. And what you can do is you can click on GitHub and then go to my repo for this project, for this presentation, which is accordion, uh, here I'll zoom in a little more, accordionguy.devfest Florida 2019. And it'll open the repository and you'll see a list of files with the .ipynb, short for IPython notebook. Those are Jupyter Notebook's old names. And each of these files is a Jupyter Notebook. And if I were to click on this, all of a sudden, you get taken to the Jupyter Notebook that I'm using for the first part of this presentation. And you can scroll through it, and you can follow along. And later on, when I show you Jupyter Notebooks with code in them, and I will explain everything, I promise, you can also follow along, look at the code. You can even monkey with it and write your own stuff. If you feel like it, take the time, write, uh, rewrite, my, rewrite my notebook if you like. <laughs> Go ahead. It's, it, it, uh, you're, you'll be working on your own local copy. You can, uh, you can do as much experimenting with Jupyter Notebooks during this presentation as you like. That's part of the purpose of it. So let me get started. First of all, a quick introduction. My name is Joey Davila. I'm lead product manager at a Tampa-based software development firm called Sourcetoad. Some of my coworkers have very, very kindly uh, come in to say hi, uh, say hi and watch the presentation. Sourcetoad, uh, Sourcetoad is a web, Internet of Things, uh, mobile application devel uh, development shop. We have an emphasis on two important things, crunching complex data and actually finishing products. Uh, we've been around for 10 years, or 40 net internet years, uh, and it's an amazing place to work. I have, I, have enjoyed, uh, I have enjoyed my time there. I plan to be there for a good long time. I'm also wearing another hat. I'm representing RayWenderlich.com. Uh, it is a great mobile uh, development tutorial site. We've got a table out there. 
Uh, we're raffling off some books. Uh, go, ch uh, go check it out. And if you run a meetup, uh, especially for mobile and web programming, uh, do uh, talk to us because we provide free books for we provide free tutorial books for meetups. People love uh, people love that sort of thing, and people love getting free stuff. So we're happy to help you make your meetup the best it could possibly be. But uh, Jupyter notebooks really are just code, uh, code and text melded together. So it's a tool for sharing for sharing knowledge, for collaborating, for creating documents with code embedded inside them. Uh, this may not seem uh, this may not seem groundbreaking, but it's actually funny because in the end, despite the fact that we have web pages with embedded JavaScript, and you know there used to be there used to be Java applets, but there are already uh, a gazillion ways of embedding working code inside documents in the form of web pages. Jupyter notebooks are really are, are still really really useful simply because it just makes it easier to uh, to embed that code. Uh, sticking code, sticking JavaScript inside a web page still takes uh, still takes a lot of work, still takes a lot of scaffolding, still takes a, a lot uh, a lot of your time to just make it work. Jupyter notebooks makes it faster. And the spirit of Jupyter Notebooks, it comes from the ongoing quest to explain things. The way we used to do it was, as I describe here, uh, originally we used to do it in, in the notebooks of scientists, mathematicians, and madmen. Or in other words, books that look like this. Notice that on the left page, there's a textual explanation, but on the right page, the scientist is also, I can't remember which scientist this is, is also showing their work. They're showing, they're showing the calculations they made. They're show, uh, there are also diagrams. This has everything that, uh, that the Jupyter Notebook is aiming for except for interactivity because you cannot, you just can't get interactivity with paper and ink. The closest you can get is a pop-up book. There's also spreadsheets, which people misuse the hell out of. This is actually a pretty nice example of a spreadsheet. But once again, we're talking about data. We're talking about textual information. And there actually is some code happening in a spreadsheet. It is the formulas in a spreadsheet or the macros that you hide in them. Uh, and uh, it's this kind of power that lets people go, OK, you know what? I'm going to use spreadsheets a lot of times the wrong way for the wrong uh, for the wrong purposes, um, there is a large there is a large international store that until recently um, I won't name them uh, their name begins with a W uh, handled all their uh, optical insurance processing by mailing a spreadsheet around back and forth, and that's how they uh, and that's how they handled all the insurance processing. Uh, because the spreadsheet would always go out of date because it was being emailed and edited by different people at different times, they were losing single-digit millions of dollars a year. But for company W, that's a rounding error. But in the end, they, they fixed it because they just decided we're going to use the right tool for the right purpose. The closest thing in spirit to Jupyter Notebooks are Mathematica Notebooks. In fact, they are, uh, in fact, yeah, they call it a notebook. It is a computational notebook, which means there's general discussion, there's text, but there's also an interactive, there's an interactive and a code component. So this, you can play with the data, and the code is doing the calcula, uh, the code is displaying its results right before you, and of course you can look at the code, you can show your work, and in the math and scientific world, that is one of the most important things, showing your work. The problem with Mathematica notebooks is they're proprietary. They use a proprietary language. Uh, they're very hard to uh, they're very hard to share openly, and that's where Jupyter notebooks come in. This is this is an actual Jupyter notebook. I will show you in a little bit. It is an analysis of the text of the Harry Potter books, and the different ways that Harry and Ron get treated versus the way Hermione gets treated, as you can probably tell by the title of the presentation. But Jupyter Notebooks are based on the same concept as Mathematica, except it's all based on open source tools. And here's where the name Jupyter comes from. It's from the three primary languages that it was meant to support. 
Uh, anybody here familiar with Julia? It's the one that people know the least. It is an academic programming language, very strong, um, uh, very strong support for mathematics. And of course, we've all heard of Python. Python is uh, a favorite language of mine. Uh, I had to learn it in a week at Burning Man, and any language you can learn at Burning Man has to be a good one, because Burning Man has lots of distractions. And finally, there is the R programming language as well, another favorite of uh, data scientists. Once again, very, very strong math focus. But you're not stuck with just Julia, Python, or R with Jupyter Notebooks. Yeah, that's where, the, uh, that's where it gets its name from, but you can use up to 50 different languages. There are um, Every Jupyter Notebook has a built, uh, can use a built-in kernel, and the kernel is the way that it processes code. So if you just decide, um, you know what, I want to do it in JavaScript, I want to do it in Scala, I want to do it in Ruby, or even Kotlin, you can, yeah, you just switch out the kernel, and then you can, uh, you can write the code part of a, Julia no uh, of a Jupyter Notebook in that particular language. Python seems to be the favorite. Uh, simply because it's the darling of the data science world right now. And it's quite nice. So there's a little uh, academic competition called the Nobel Prize for economics. I know economics is not a real Nobel. There's a footnote in there. But this year's winner of the Nobel Prize in economics is a guy who, handed, uh, who wrote his thesis in a Jupyter Notebook. There's a little video startup you may have heard of. It's called Netflix. It is heavily data driven. They make money when you are happily watching videos and you are happily watching videos if the opening screen of Netflix is showing you the next thing you would love to watch. As a result, they are a very heavily data driven organization. And yeah, I can click on, um, since this is a web page, I can jump straight to Oh, Medium, you are the worst. Anyways, <laughs> I can jump to their article on Medium, and let's see if I can find it really quickly. They have this insane, there it is. They have this incredibly insane, insane looking data flow. This is the Jupyter Notebooks uh, infrastructure at Netflix. So Jupyter Notebooks drives a lot of the operation operations at Netflix because they are data driven and this and they are a fantastic way to process and show and collaborate on data projects. Uh, the organization that's having another conference down the hall is really big on Jupyter Notebooks and in fact if you are following the instructions I left on those sheets of paper you are actually viewing my Jupyter Notebooks through a Google tool that hoovers stuff from my GitHub repo and onto a web page for you. There's another little uh, company out of Seattle called Microsoft that are also big on Jupyter Notebooks. And yeah, they have all kinds of ways to host and run Jupyter Notebooks on the Azure cloud system. But enough talking, uh, enough talking and a little more showing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get, uh, get into uh, yeah, the basics of Jupyter Notebooks. The easiest way to get it on your system is to use the, uh, any Python people here? Got a few. Are you, are you using Anaconda? Yes, use Anaconda. It is. It's the best Python distro. It also gives you control over, easy control over which version of Python you're using. Python, Python three, or if you really need to use your old Yvonne Moldy software, Python two. But uh, the other nice thing is a lot of packages come built in, including Jupyter notebooks, up to the point where. All you have to do once, you, uh, once you've installed Anaconda is open up a terminal and type in two words, Jupyter, a space, and then notebook. And it will fire up this interface, this, uh, this interface where I can start either reading or writing Jupyter notebooks. So these pages I'm showing you are Jupyter notebooks. And like I said, yeah, once it's installed, just type this in. And like I said, if you and if you don't want to commit just yet, you can go to Jup, uh, you can go to the Try Jupiter page, which gives you a nice Jupiter notebook for you to start from scratch and start typing in code. And I will demonstrate that in just a moment. And like I said, you can look at this presentation online: colab.research.google.com, and then go to my GitHub repo, Accordion Guy slash DevFest Florida 2019. Now, 
One way to think of Jupyter Notebooks is as Excel for data science. This entire page is a Jupyter Notebook, and it consists, as I scroll down, I'm going to start clicking on things, it's actually made of cells. And these cells are basically two types. They could be text, or they could be code. And in fact, actually, yeah, as I've got this, uh, and as I've got this, uh, let me select this cell right here. If you don't want to commit just yet, there's a heading, there's a graphic. I can edit it simply by double clicking it. And suddenly I'm in edit mode. And does anybody recognize what this is? Markdown. Right. OK. Who said that? OK. Parasor Parasource toad socks for you. Ugh. The of all the places to throw it. Uh, we're, we're having projector troubles all day, right in front of the projector. OK. But thank you. Anyways, yes, that's Markdown. So Markdown is the way that you write. The, uh, most of the time, you'll be writing textual data for Jupyter Notebooks in Markdown. But you can also write, uh, and in fact, if you, oh, I don't need to do that. If you run into Markdown's limitations, for instance, doing tables in Markdown is a royal pain, you can switch to HTML. And better yet, if you are mathematically inclined, you can use LaTeX. So that, there's uh, uh, this formula, C equals uh, yeah, the hypotenuse. That is, if I double click on here, you can see how I specified the LaTeX. So double, uh, double dollar sign means this line is LaTeX. And that's how I specify the formula. And rendering a text cell is pretty easy to simply to enter. Once you've entered your text cell and you go, OK, you know what? I want this thing rendered. You basically hold down Control Enter. And boom, the cell is rendered. Now, there's uh, in addition to text cells, of course, what, makes, what really gives Jupyter Notebooks their power are code cells. So this is Python. It's just a bunch of print statements. And once again, control enter executes the code. And the executed code, and any output from the executed code appears before the, uh, below the code cell. Other things you can do are execute shell commands. So very simple. In a code cell, any line that begins with an exclamation mark just gets shunted over to, uh, gets executed as a shell command. So I'm going to control enter on this code line. And boom, I have the directory of uh, the current, uh, I have the current directory right there. And then there are magic commands. These are specific to notebooks. They are very handy little utilities. The magic command I'm going to use here are, they all begin with percent signs. And I'm going to use time and time it. They're, they're for timing the execution of code. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to execute this cell. And it is, going to, uh, it is going to roll dice one million times. Time is quick. Time it provides a little more statistical information. But yes, this is, uh, as the code is running, you'll see that the code cell is marked with an asterisk. That means the code is running. When it finally executes, it appears with a number. That tells you the execution order of each cell. So this is the third. Uh, this is the third cell to be executed on this page. That's what uh, that's what this uh, this thing is. And once again, I've got the output. Uh, I'm going to race through this re. Uh, I'm going to race through this part really quickly. Once again, you can see this on GitHub. But this is an example of how a Jupyter notebook could be used. I am explaining how recommendation engines work. So I'm saying, look, let's say we have. Let's say we have these people who are clearly stuck in the year 2012 rating these particular alt-rock bands. So Angelica gave Blues Traveler a 3.5, whereas Sam, who's a total hippie, rated uh, Blues Traveler with a 5. So this is a, uh, so I'm basically saying, OK, recommendation engines basically work on the principle that people who like the same stuff I like are probably good recommenders. And I explained, well, guess what? We can take this chart and turn it into this Python dictionary. Now, for those of you who've been programming a long time, you're going, yeah, yeah, I know, right? 
But this is a fantastic way to teach programming to a lot of people. Basically, show them something graphically, and then show them the code equivalent. And then a little more, a little more text saying, okay, you know what? This is how recommendation engines work, and what we're going to do is, if you turn people's recommendations into po uh, points on a chart, you'll know when people are similar, when they are geographically close to each other, and then we introduce uh, one of the simplest similarity algorithms called the Manhattan distance. Here, let me shrink this a little more. And then we code it up. But the idea behind the Jupyter Notebook is it's a fantastic way to not only explain, not just to tell, but also to show. Because all of a sudden I can go, OK, let's, let's execute this code. So we'll define the users. And then I'll click on this cell that defines the Manhattan distance. And then I can go, OK, I want the Manhattan distance between these two users. Let's execute this. And there we go. The, uh, the, form, uh, the uh, subroutine gets executed, and we go, OK, Manhattan distance between these people is 6.0, et cetera. But it's a great way to learn. Uh, it's a great way to explain concepts, uh, not just programming, but anything where you have to do a little bit of computing to get a result. Or if you have to do some computing to crunch through some data to display it graphically, and I'm going to show you that, I'm going to show you that next. All right. Somebody worked really hard on this um, acronym. It's Vader. It is sentiment analysis. It is fantastic for use in Twitter. And what it does is it does, it, it does sentiment analysis for positive, neutral, and negative sentiment in a given sentence by identifying words and emoticons used in the sentence. The first thing we need to do is do some setup. And that means installing a particular Python package, which I can do in a Jupyter Notebook, because I, uh, I have this statement that calls pip python installer to, inst uh, to install that package. So I can execute it right now. I probably already have it, so yes, it says requirement already satisfied. It's there. Now what I need to do is I'm going to import Vader and write a really simple, uh, this is a simple, uh, a simple uh, subroutine, and all it does is it just takes an array of sentences and runs them through Vader and spits out the output. Really simple. I'm going to execute it now. So now it's been. Uh, now I've imported Vader and defined that. And now I'm going to execute Vader on these sentences. Vader is smart, handsome, and funny, uh, with different kinds of emphasis, including periods, exclamation marks, semi swear words and emoji. But yeah, as you can see, as you can see, it, uh, it, it reprints the statement and then rates it for, for sentiment. Notice that uh, most of them have no negative sentiment. That's what neg is short for. A little neutral sentiment, but strong, like generally 70% or better positive sentiment. Uh, normally, you'd be a uh, Normally, uh, to kind of figure out how Vader worked or how you could possibly use it or explore it, you would have to do it in the command line. Now you can, uh, now you can tear through it really quickly and even explain it using a Jupyter Notebook. I'm going to do the same thing with negative sentences. So once again, I select a cell and hit Control-Enter to execute the code within that cell. And now you notice that you know, calling it stupid, ugly, and not funny says about 70% negative sentiment and no positive sentiment. And then we're going to mix things up, which is why I'm using this image. And I'm going to analyze this, sentences, in, in, this sentence, including things like uh, Venom. Anybody see the movie Venom? OK. I wrote, it's a mess of a movie, but I still enjoyed it for some reason. And notice it figured out the sentiment there. 0.108 negative, 60% neutral, a little more than a quarter positive. It's really good at analyzing it. And the nice thing is, of course, I learned a lot about this package by playing, uh, by playing it around with the Jupyter Notebook. And I can leave uh, a trail of breadcrumbs for other people who are, 
who are going to use it. Now I'm going. Uh, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump. I'm going to skip the boring financial analysis one and jump into widgets really quickly. Because actually, uh, because of the uh, schedule, I actually have no idea how much time I have left. So, <laughs> twelve minutes. Okay, perfect. So widgets, what they do is they let me. Uh, uh, they let me define a little more interactivity. Up till now, I have only been showing you Python programs that just have output. There are ways to get input, and then, of course, you can write further Python scripts to take advantage of that output. So there are... Oh, I've... Hang on just a sec. Notice I got an error here, and that's because, as you can see, name widgets is not defined. This is one of the dangers of a Jupyter Notebook, and that is out of order execution. It is easy to execute something in the wrong order. What I forgot to do was control click on this cell, which actually says import the, widget, import the widgets package so I can use widgets. So I'm gonna run that, that's done. So now you can see here on the left side, it is the second cell that's been executed in this notebook. But I'm going to re-execute this cell. So control enter. It is now the third cell that's been executed in this notebook. And take a look. I have a text field. And notice it's fairly easy. I basically define the text field by instantiating a text field object. And I say, OK, display it. But the other thing I'm doing is I'm saying, look, on the submit, uh, on submit, once, uh, once that event occurs, execute a method called echo text field contents, which I have defined here. Echo text field contents, and it simply prints the contents of the text field. So I'm going to type in whoop whoop, enter, and there we go. Uh, I, uh, let's see, Jupyter Notebook widgets are fairly straightforward. So that's the button. Slider, once again. So you can use these to actually collect, uh, collect user input and then uh, use, those, uh, use that user input as parameters for your, own, uh, for your own applications. So progress bar, there's just about everything. Uh, there's just about everything in the, uh, that's possible on a web page in the widgets. Uh, in, in, the widget, in the widgets package. Uh, who here saw Black Mirror Bandersnatch? Choose your own adventure in Black Mirror. Okay. Very few, you all know that there are very few happy endings in Black Mirror, and I've made a short, interactive Jupyter, uh, Jupyter notebook game. So what I need to do is I need to describe the situation that you're in. So what I'm going to do is I've created an HTML object. So this HTML object will represent the HTML that is inside that big here doc screen. Basically, you've made some bad choices. What do you do? And I'm going to present you, like Bandersnatch, you have two choices, so I'm going to define two buttons. Button number one is labeled bad choice number one. You can click on it, and this is the result. You're screwed. Perfect. Very black mirror. Okay, button number two, same deal. Bad choice number two. It will respond to a click, and here is that response to a click. You're screwed even worse. Finally, we need a label in which that outcome should appear. So I instantiate a label, and I give it just uh, at three asterisks as its initial value. And then finally, I draw the controls. That's it. I execute it, and here we go. That's the HTML. You're in an episode of Black Mirror. Tech is out of control. You are now in a pickle. What do you do? Bad choice one or bad choice two, people? Two. Oh, you are Black Mirror viewers. You're screwed even worse. <laughs> so there you go. Let's do one more, and that is basically, let's do the real, uh, le let me show you some slightly more hardcore data science. I'm going to jump to the sexiest demo I have, which is Montreal crime data. Uh, anybody here been to Montreal? Actually, shockingly safe city. It is, uh, the, the odds of your getting killed, uh, the odds of your being in a homicide in Montreal, in fact, I think I wrote it here, yeah, are one in a million. 
compared to Tampa, where your odds are 80 in a million, or Orlando, where it's 300 in a million? So I'm, I'm watching you all. <laughs> OK. But anyways, and uh, the police in protest of, I believe it was bad pay, for three years were wearing non-regulation pants with their uniforms. But the important thing is, I'm just going, look, what I'm going to do is I'm going to import here a whole bunch of data, sci uh, data science utilities. Pandas is good for dealing with stuff in t uh, data in tabular form. Uh, NumPy is numerical processing. There is Folium, which is for uh, which is for displaying maps. Plotly for plotting graphs, that kind of thing. I'm, uh, I defined a whole bunch of packages that I would import, a bunch of constants, some map functions. We're not going to worry about that because we're running low on time. But what I'm going to do now is get the data from a source. Thankfully, Montreal believe in open data, and they have been publishing crime data for the past five or six years. And I got the data set. It's in CSV form. It's locally on my machine. So I'm going to crunch it out. But one thing I want to do is I want to make sure, hey, did I get it right? Luckily, Pandas, Pandas data frames, which are the tables they work with, have a uh, handy formula called head, which displays in very nicely format, uh, in a very nice format, the first few rows of a table. And I'm going, OK, this is fine. Notice that's in, that it's in French. But that's OK, because what I can do, I'm going to, here we go. Can we translate to, this to English? Yes, very easily. The way we do it is we create, uh, we, we create a crime mapping, and uh, we uh, look at the column titles, and we just map them to their English equivalent. So actually, yes, the French word introduction actually means burglary in English. It's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of odd. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to run this. I'm going to execute this cell. I'm going to execute this cell to translate date formats. Basically, this is a very handy thing. Uh, Jupyter Notebooks plus Python data tools means you can clean up and re reprocess, data set, reprocess data sets as needed. So I'm limiting the crime, uh, data to crime from uh, 2015 to 2017, doing a little more column stuff. And now, if I look at the data frame, notice that I've translated stuff into English. Things have been normalized. I have massaged the data the way I need it. And it's time to map some crime. Give it a moment. The asterisk. This asterisk right here means that it's crunching data. And I may have cursed myself by adding this little sticker here. Works on my machine. Let's see. There's always one Murphy's, uh, there's always one Murphy's Law moment in a, uh, oh, there we go. In a presentation. But yes. Hang on, let me scroll this into view. What I can do is, by scrolling in, I can zoom in. These are numbers of crimes in specific regions in Montreal. Uh, this is data that's all been yanked out of that table. And I can, keep click I can keep zooming in until I see map markers. And then I can actually go click and see what uh, see what the details are. Uh, various misdemeanor, vehicle contents or parts theft, that sort of thing, robbery. But if I scroll through this code, let me scroll back through the code. I don't think I am doing this in more than uh, three or 400 lines of Python, all told. I mean, most of it is being done right here in this line where uh, what am I doing? I'm uh, defining some convenience functions, and I'm importing a whole boatload of libraries. That's the power of Jupyter Notebooks, which leads me to the outro going forward. If you want to get deep into it, for starters, one of the best things you can do is you can watch a video made by one of Jupyter Notebooks' biggest detractors. Uh, data scientist Joel Gruss, he has a very impressive title. He is senior research engineer at the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence. This 
This organization sounds like uh, a place where the bad guy in a Batman movie becomes a supervillain because of a lab accident. But he does list important reasons why he doesn't like Jupyter Notebooks. We ran into one of them. Actually, it's the first one, out-of-order execution. Uh, there are also a whole bunch of other things, including the fact that uh, Jupyter Notebooks, as is, uh, don't really support testing, uh, unit testing very well. We're going. Uh, but I believe they are evolving, and uh, we. W uh, but in the meantime, if you're going to use Jupyter notebooks, you're going to have to come up with some clever, some interesting practices on your own to make sure that you're you're properly unit testing uh, the code that you're writing for it. The best way to learn about Jupyter notebooks actually is by looking at other people's notebooks, and there is a gallery of interesting Jupyter notebooks on GitHub. Uh, I link to it right here. Once again, uh, if you need my GitHub repo, you can get this entire presentation and run it interactively. The two best books I've found are Introduction to Data Science, which actually uh, treat, uh, teaches data science by way of a Jupyter notebook in textbook form. It's fantastic. And PACT have a whole bunch of books on Jupyter notebooks. Packed books are of varying quality, but this is the least worst of them, beginning data science with Python and Jupyter. This is still a new area, so there's not that much in the way of textbooks out there. You're going to be learning mostly by reading other people's Jupyter notebooks and looking at their code and by personal experience. But you know what? That's OK. Data science is the, hot, uh, the sexiest job of the 21st century. And if you know data science and Python right now, it's like knowing Objective-C and a tiny bit of iPhone programming in late 2007. These are the early days, and there are a lot of great opportunities. Then finally, I know I'm running out of time, but if you want to talk more about Jupyter Notebooks or anything in general, actually, I'm available. I'm a Cordian guy on Twitter, and I have a tech blog called Global Nerdy at globalnerdy.com. And yeah, once again, uh, yeah, you can get uh, yeah you can get started immediately. In fact, if you want to noodle around with Jupyter notebooks without having to install anything, do a Google search for Try Jupyter. It should be at Jupyter. I believe the URL is Jupyter.org/try. <laughs> Betty, what's up? You have a question. Uh, you know what? Uh, some people think the accordion's hard. I think it's easy. I'm a frustrated guitar player myself, and I know guitar players who say it's easy. <laughs> Darlene, you got to let me know. Should I sleep or should I code? If I sleep, I'll miss the milestone. And if I code, I'll break my head bone. So come on and let me know. Should I sleep or should I code? Thanks very much.